the Olympic campaign in 2016. And as you may or may not know, and if you didn't see the race in Rio in the final, if you ever want to see someone run a bend really, really well, watch your team start in that relay. It's an awesome, awesome event. So I'll pass it over to you, Keem. Um, and thank you so much for joining us, man. I really appreciate it. No, man, it's a pleasure to be here, BJ. You know, I think, uh, I don't think people understand how much you and I spent time together wise. BJ worked a lot on me to make sure that, you know, our body was tuned up. And, you know, I actually kind of, kind of want to talk a little bit about the past two years before we get to 2016 because I think so many times right um, as athletes people tell you about the Olympics and they they kind of push you in the you got to do this and do this to get to the Olympic Games but you don't get to the Olympic Games on an Olympic year you get to that by making small increments each and every single day throughout the years right so what BJ was talking about when I got to Altus. The year before, I had just ran my last year at the University of Alabama. Didn't really go as well how, how I would have liked it to be, battling a whole bunch of different injuries. You know, I was mixing up with my coach a little bit. There was a lot of things that was happening. So before I got to Altus, Stu, my coach at the time, you know, he calls me because he had heard that I was going to step away from track because initially, you know, I, it, it was never really a dream for me to go to the Olympics, even though I had been to one prior before 2016, right? But he calls me and he says, Akeem, man, I'm, I'm, I'm out here in Phoenix. I would love for you to come out and, you know, give this thing another shot. And I said, man, I'll think about it. What date do you want me to come out by? What date are you guys starting? He says, man, we're starting October 4th. And, you know, being the, being the sprinter that I was, I made my decision October 3rd. So, so I got down there, um, but I knew this. Um, I didn't have the necessarily the amount of money that I needed to be able to sustain a living there, right? I think as athletes, each and every single one of you, coaches as well, knows the word sacrifice and what that means. In order to get to a certain level in your life, you have to sacrifice something. No matter what it is, you have to sacrifice an area to get something else. Life has a tug and pull type of basis. So I knew that if I could go down there, I would only be able to fund myself for a couple months. Well, most people didn't know, and I'm pretty sure BJ found this out later down the road, or maybe he did. But when I moved down there, it was a leap of faith to believe in myself and believe what I could do and what I was capable of doing. I did not have a bed when I first got to Phoenix for four months. Right. Okay. I want to say it again. Right. Because sometimes when I say that, people are like, hey, what are you talking about? No. Like when I moved to Phoenix, I had a blanket, I had a pillow, and I had clothes and I had some sheets. And when I got to my apartment, I was staying with a friend, uh, with my teammate, um, Anaso Jabidwana at the time. And I told him my situation. I said, man, I'm going to give you money when I have it, but this is the situation right now. But in due time, like I know that I will be able to, to, to pay up my part. So when I got down there, all I had was <laughs> I would go to sleep on the floor and wake up on the floor. And every morning I would have this headache, right? Because everything was rushed from the floor all the way up. So the way how I went towards practice wasn't necessarily to play games, right? My mentality and my focus was a little bit different. So every single day I said, you know what, man, I have to do one thing that will help me get closer to where I am trying to get to. I think during this time, you know, the pandemic has taught us many different things. I'm sure it's revealed a lot of things about ourselves as well too. But as athletes and as coaches, one thing that we have over those who aren't is the fact that we're able to be adaptable and we can adjust just as quickly. Right. So I think the thing that helped me throughout my career, especially leading up to that year, was I didn't know when it was going to come together. I had no idea when it was going to come together, but I knew that it would come together at some point. So every single day I said, I got to show up and showing up means different things to different people. Right. When I'm talking about showing up, I'm talking about one thing that is going to help you get closer to your mark. And the one thing that helped me get closer to my mark was I needed to maximize what I was doing at the track each and every single day. And BJ knows, some days he'd talk to me, he'd say, man, Akeem, how you feeling today? I was like, BJ, you know, 
not feeling the best today, but I'm going to go ahead and make the most of today. And there were some days where he would come, he would see me and he would be like, he wouldn't say anything, but he would know. Physically, I was there, but he didn't know the fact that I was going home sometimes and I wasn't eating because I didn't have money for food, right? He didn't know that sometimes I would be coming to practice and I didn't sleep the night before because it's kind of hard to sleep on the floor and being in one position, right? And BJ also knows there are times where, you know, <laughs> him and Stu would talk and they would say, man, why is it that Akeem leaves the training facility and when he comes back, his body is just jacked up? And they didn't know that <laughs> I might have been fixed at training, but I was going home and I was kind of dis disassembling everything else. But I knew one thing in mind, I had to continue to show up, right? Because I'm a firm believer that if you continue to show up in the small things at some point, at some point, the things that you're showing up for, you'll see a harvest from it, you'll see a benefit from it, right? So the story that puts all this together um, happened when I was 13 years old. When I was 13 years old, I remember playing football. And as I was playing football, um, I went to my coach and he said, you know, Akeem, we just need one thing for you to do. We need you to get the sheet filled out, get, get tested by the doctors, fill it out, the physical form, and then come back, man, and you'll be good to go and you'll play, you know, football. So I go to the, so I go to the doctors the next day with my mom. And the doctor's checking me out. He says, Akeem, how you feeling? I said, I'm feeling good. He says, man, are you breathing okay? He's like, yeah, man, I'm feeling good. He's like, man, are you recovering okay? I was like, man, this is, I'm good. Like, what's, what's going on? You're like, I'm good. And he goes and he puts the stethoscope on my legs. He says, okay, okay. Puts it on my arms. And then he gets to my chest. He gets to my heart. And he says, man, are you sure you're feeling okay? I said, yeah, like, I don't have any problems recovering. It's all good. And he goes outside and he gets another doctor. And the doctor does the same thing. And he looks at me, he says, I'm sorry, Akeem, I can't clear you to play. I said, I said, what do you mean you can't clear me to play? Like my coach said, in order to play football, I, I gotta give you this physical form. You fill out the form and I go and I play football. Like that's the situation. And he says, man, I can't clear you to play because I found an irregular heartbeat. I said, what, what does that mean? He says, man, like I don't wanna clear you to play and then you get hit a certain way and you don't get up from that, right? And I remember looking over my mom and seeing the tears come down her face because she didn't understand the situation at hand. She didn't understand what was going on and she knew she couldn't help me. Later that night, I was sitting on the steps and my mom came over to me and she said, Akeem, what are you gonna do? I said, mom, I'm going to practice. And she said, what? I had already made up in my mind that I was going to finish what I started despite what the outcome was going to be, right? That moment at 13 years old, when I was playing football, after I got the news, every single day I went to practice, I ran, I caught balls like everybody else. I did every single thing that everybody else did. I just didn't play. But the next year I was able to play. But I knew how I handled that situation was going to either allow me to rise to the challenge and help me somewhere down the road moving forward, or I was going to be trapped by that situation because when it was time to elevate myself, I averted back down. So when I got to Altus and I kind of had to make a decision again about how I'm gonna handle being in a position to sleeping on the floor all over again, I had already dealt with that before. A lot of people talk about the angle. The angle was cool. You should always aim for the end goal. You should always aim for these things that you're trying to accomplish. But understand that who you are along the way is much greater than the end goal because it teaches you things and skills that you can take with you. I wasn't worried about making the Olympic team, but I knew if I handled what was in front of me, those things was probably going to come, right? But I knew I had to show up each and every single day despite how I felt. So there are going to be some days where you're going up to practice and you're probably sore, probably not going well, probably annoyed a little bit training isn't going so well and you just may not you, you may be in this rut and you may feel stuck but continue to show up right and just do one thing right I had to talk to myself so many different ways so many different times in order to get myself pumped up to get to the training session when things wasn't going so well right from 2010 to 2015 I did not run a personal best 
indoors. I got destroyed. It was embarrassing. It sucked. It it hurt the ego. But I knew, man, once I once I once once I line things up, once I get healthy, like once I get to a position where I can be confident, I just know, I just know it's gonna come together at some point, right? My question and my challenge to you guys, this is what has always helped me and has shaped me. How can you find the good in every situation that you find yourself in? It's not always going to be jump out at you at the very moment. It's not always going to be easy to see. But when I wasn't running well all those times and before indoors, I just said, you know what? I haven't ran well because I haven't found the right formula and the program that works for me. I knew it was going to come. Even though I didn't know that when it was going to come, I knew that it was going to come, but I still had to continue to show up. There's something to be said about the process of getting up and making the most of every opportunity, making the most of these sessions that adds up over time and then the results come. People get so fixated on running fast or jumping far right now, rather than seeing that it's one thing to do well for a given moment, but to be progressively moving in the right direction over time. Man, that'll, that right there is what separates most people because they want it right now. They want it right now. But sometimes what you get right now, you don't sustain it over time. So challenging yourself every day, how can I do one thing that is going to help me get better and help me work towards the mark? Every day, just wake up and think about what is one thing I can do that's gonna help me get closer to the mark today. And I guarantee if you continue to show up every single day and make the most of each day, I'm telling you, at some point, like good things are going to be are going to happen. You know, I'm a I'm a testament of it, and I'm sure you guys are too. But just the constant reminder to get up and do one thing, just one thing. Maybe it's training, right? Maybe it's after training, you got to come home and you got to eat that extra broccoli, right? Like whatever it is, just do one thing that is going to help you get better. And those habits will come and kick in when your motivation may not be there. That's awesome, Kim. Is, is anyone got any questions directly? I've got a couple, but uh, has anyone got any questions for right now? Okay, well, I, you mentioned before, which I love, Akeem, like basically finding that thing that sort of gets you up and gets this, the, the thing that brings you joy in that particular day, in that moment. So I think you said that the thing, it's good. Yeah. I feel like when athletes do start their journey as being a track and field athlete, it's usually one thing that keeps them going for the first little bit. And then that thing kind of gets a little bit old or it's sort of, it, it's used up. How do you know when to change that motivation or change that cue or change that thing that, that's good that gets you through that particular day, that particular training session? Yeah, man. Well, you know, when I first started, hey, I just wanted to miss, I just wanted to miss days of school. Right. So I, I heard you could sign up for this thing. You could miss school. I'm like, man, I was, you know, sign me up. Right. But as as I got older, BJ, to be honest, man, 2017, there there were some sessions where, you know, um, my coach at the time, Stu, one time Stu came over to me and we're doing blocks and he says, man, what's going on? I said, Stu, I'm bored. <laughs> Right. Because because Mondays like track is one of the only sports, right, where you get to a point where all your days, you kind of know what it's going to look like. Right. Monday is going to look the same. Tuesday is kind of going to look the same Wednesday, Thursday. And it's just like, man, I'm doing the same thing every single day. What I did that helped me, I said, OK, I, 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 I realized two things. Sometimes greatness is very boring because you're doing the same thing. Right. But how can you make what is boring, exciting? And I don't mean boring in the sense of like, you know, a bad thing. I just mean like doing the same thing over and over and over again, no matter what it is, at what level it can be redundant. You can kind of take yourself out of it. So for me, what I started to do was I started to use times when I was warming up to educate myself a little bit more. Right, I knew I had to switch up something mentally. So it started for me, BJ, simply as this. I would go into sessions, instead of listening to um, music, I would listen to uh, a motivational talk, 
right? I would listen to a podcast, right? So even though the, 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 the physical environment was the same, up top, something was different and I could sense something in practice. And then I would start to talk to myself a little bit, BJ. I would say, man, I would see, you know, at Altus, it were so many, so many different guys. So I would say, you know what? I would say, Javid, how about this? We have, a, we have a block day. I said, if you beat me to 30 meters, I'll buy you coffee, right? I'll buy you coffee at 30 meters. You're not going to, but I'll buy you coffee. You beat me 30 meters. And he would go, no, nah, man. I was like, okay, man, well, put your money where your mouth is, right? So those were the things that I would do to help myself get back into it. And I would self-talk very frequently because here's the thing. Sometimes the best things you will ever hear are the things that you say to yourself. Right. So sometimes you have to talk to yourself in such a way to excite yourself that even though you're doing the same kind of system and the same rhythmic flow, that you create this challenge inside of your head. Right. So you may be going through talking the biggest stuff that you've ever said, even though you're going through it. So for me, it was just playing these games that would kind of rewire me to do the same thing all over again. I really like that comment. Some of the best things you'll hear are coming from, from you know, internal dialogue. I, th I think it's a really, really powerful comment. Um, John had a question. What was uh, one big negative surprise? I mean, I think you mentioned that earlier with the, um, the heart arrhythmia, but uh, what's one big negative surprise that fell on you and how did you overcome it? You know, um, I remember I've, oh man, I've, I've had so many, so many moments like that. Um, I'll tell you, like, it wasn't really a negative one as much as more. It was a, it was a, a learning one, even though I was at that stage. 20, 2015, you know, I went on to run 651, uh, the third fastest Canadian time of all time. And at that time, I was number two in the world. I was number one for like a day, <laughs> for like 18 hours. <laughs> and I was just like, wait a minute. Right, and I'll never forget, I was in Sweden and I was getting ready to run, you know, I'm a type of person where, you know, I get zoned in and locked in when it's time to go. And I'm warming up, right? Doing my same old thing, you know, feeling good, you know, you know, excited to go talking to myself, Akeem, man, you're a machine, you're a monster, you're a beast, you're gonna destroy everybody, right? Talking this way. And I see Kim Collins, uh, like just kind of sauntering around. Kim Collins is, is, a, is a sprinter for St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, at 41 years old, he ran 9-9. Like Kim Collins is just a machine, right? But I remember seeing him kind of sauntering around, right? But he's looking at me. I'm doing my strides and this and that. And he's looking at me. I'm thinking this like, man, am I going to have to fight Kim? Like, why is he looking at me like this? Like, <laughs> why is he looking at me like this? And he calls me over. And he says, man, you're, 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 you're warming up too hard. I said, what? Cause I'm a type of person where like hard work, like you're like, I was hard work pays off, right? Like you gotta work hard. And he says, man, you're working way too hard. And he says, I can tell you've been working way too hard your whole career. You gotta understand, like we're about to race in 30 minutes in 30 minutes. And he's, He's playing these games in my head. I'm trying to understand, like, why are you? And he says, man, I'm gonna give you an advice. And, I, and this advice is what helped me and hopefully will help you. And he says, um, every single day you get up and you go to training and you go through the same motions and you go through the same things. And when you close your eyes, if you trust yourself enough, your body will be able to react and do what it's going to do. So when it's time to race, all you have to do is react to the gun. But if you give all of your energy as you're warming up, you're gonna tie yourself out and I'm just gonna beat you and I'm not even trying. And so I think sometimes in negative situations, I don't call that one negative. It was a moment where I learned from it and that actually helped me throughout my career. But a negative moment for me is just an opportunity to say, you know what, how can I learn and benefit from this? Um, 
one of the things that I will tell you guys right now, moving forward is you got to have short-term memory as an athlete, right? Don't let, don't take the losses too high and don't take the lows, sorry, don't take the lows too low and the wins too high, right? You kind of got to stay even keel in between because I would take my losses to heart that I would shut myself out from everybody, right? Because there was so much depending on myself doing well. I put so much pressure on myself. And because I put so much pressure on myself, even when I raced well, it was basically like I didn't run well, right? Even when I ran bad, it was the end of the world. Like, man, Akeem, you didn't do anything good. But a shift happened for me when I came back one day and I said, you know what? What did go well today? Didn't run well, but what did go well? I started to say, you know what, Akeem, man, your first 30 meters, hey, it was money. Look, we got to take that and we can apply it to another session tomorrow. All right, so for me, my negative situations, um, once I learned not to take it to heart and to find something good from it, it really helped me and propelled me um, to a different stage mentally and physically in my career. So um, I did my best. And to this day, when things don't go accustomed to how I wanted to, I try not to take the losses to heart because whatever you take to heart, you know, it's hard to use that to your advantage or get anything from it. I love that. So, and I think it's some pretty big life lessons there as well. I think you can take that sort of approach to anything you do, whether it be on the track or off the track. Um, speaking of competitions, I, I wanted to ask you about distractions because I, I always, whenever you were warming up and especially in competitions and especially when, you know, I saw you always do really well at trials and obviously step up at the games with these athletes that are currently going through this, you know, every year they're kind of, getting better and hopefully going to be bigger competitions. The distractions get more and more intense. They become more and more, you know, like a, a festival. I mean, the Olympics is essentially a big festival. So yeah. did you have any sort of uh, structure or process around making sure that you weren't distracted? Was it just part of your personality or how did you approach things when you got to meets that were a little bit more than what you compared to that before? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I learned that at my time in junior college at Barton Community College. And, you know, I, I got to tell the story behind that so you can get the whole image. When I first got to America, I was running at Nebraska and I was so excited to run, right? My teammates were all excited. Everybody was excited to run. And, you know, we feed off that energy, right? And so I was listening to all of this intense music, right? It was my, my energy was high. I was warming up so hard because, you know, everybody was excited. I was feeding off that and I was listening to this high movement music and I was so excited and I was warming up so hard and so hard and so hard and so hard. And then I got to the race and I had nothing because <laughs> I was warming up so hard because I fed into something that didn't work for me. So to answer your question, I learned that I have to get into a position that is right for me. I'm a low key guy. I'm, the, I'm, 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 I'm competing, I'm calm. My demeanor is usually the same. The only time that it really changes is if I'm like speaking or presenting, but usually it's the same, right? So for me, I found a system that works for me. It's so hard not to get caught up into other people's things. You know, They may say, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. You gotta do this, try this, try that. Once you find what works for you, do that. In high pressure situations, what, what doesn't help people excel in those moments is they get to these meets and these moments where the pressure seems higher and they change what they've been doing, right? When you get to a high pressure situation, don't change what you've been doing, just do what you've been doing because you've put eight months into doing it this way. So you might as well see this way, how far it can go, because chances are doing it that way got you the qualifying times to get you to nationals, that got you the qualifying times to make these teams. So I realized for me in high pressure situations, double down on my thing that works for me, my trading program, and double down on what got me there and not feed too much into what didn't, right? So for me, distractions are always going to come. And as you get older, the more they will come. But once you get so locked in 
into what you're doing, no matter what distractions may come your way, just reshift that focus and to dial in on what works for you. And that's what helped me. I never really worried about other people once I got focused on, on myself and what, and what got me to the big show. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Um, had a question uh, from Sahi. This could be a, one of the last few questions if someone else has got some more as well. Uh, he asked, how did you manage transitioning from high school to college and then professional and then retirement? It's a pretty big question. <laughs> But I guess those transitions are big, especially a Canadian athlete where, you know, you're not in the U.S. Most of the athletes that uh, do well in Canada do go down to the U.S. for a period. And I guess making those decisions and, and embracing that transition and that change, how did you do that? Yeah, so from, from, from high school, um, I had originally signed my letter of intent to go to Florida State to play football and run track. I wasn't really too focused on track too much. You know, I just kind of really wanted to play football a lot more. Right. But when I got to my junior college, some things happened um, academically and I went to junior college. Um, that first year transition was tough because I was coming off an injury. Right. As I was coming off the injury, it was my first time coming off of that. And I just figured I would be able to go right back to where I left off. Um, I was in for a big shock because that's not what it was. Right. And then when I went down there and at the time I was number one and number two in Canada, depending on what category. And I got down there to Barton Community College and I was the fifth fastest person on my team. <laughs> right. So I'm going through, I'm like, wait a minute. So he fast, he fast, he wait a minute. The whole squad, the whole squad is fast. And so I had to learn that if I was going to do well and to get back to where I was, I was going to have to do the small things way better than anybody else because I realized that they weren't doing that. They were doing all the track stuff, man, working hard on the track, um, not so much in the weight room. You know, my, my teammates kind of dodged that a little bit, but I knew that I had to do something that was going to separate me. So I started doing the small things, you know, the stretching, the rolling out. And this is coming from someone who doesn't like stretching or rolling out, but I knew that they weren't doing it. And this was going to give me the edge. So once I got myself back into um, being the top recruited junior college, when I went to Alabama, um, the stakes was a little bit different because, you know, at junior college, you know, it, 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 it is hard. It's tough. Um, but at Alabama, especially in the SEC, it's more people, right? There was five, my teammates at Barton Community College, they were the fastest guys in, in the whole JUCO. So, you know, the fastest guys are right there training with me. But then you go to Alabama and every single person has seven of these guys on, on the squad. And so the transition there for me really just happened in school, right? You're, you're, you're leaving to go to SEC championships. SEC championship starts on Thursday, but you're leaving on Sunday. So you're missing the whole week of school. Um, but I always knew that competition is going to be competition once you feel like you're prepared to rise to the level of competition. Everybody is running fast. So I knew I had to run fast. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew I had to run fast. Everybody's running fast and you are the sum total of what you surround yourself with. So the atmosphere of it, um, that transition from Barton Community College to Alabama, it wasn't too hard because I was already used to running, you know, running with guys who are running 10 O's and 10 1. Now the transition from the pros to uh, the, from college to the pros, I was actually more suited for the transition to the pros than I was in college because it allowed me more room to get healthy so I could recover more. Because in college, you're running every single week, whether you want to or not, right? And so at the professional level, it allowed me more time to recover. I didn't have to run every single week. I could run one week, take a week off, get realigned, get myself ready, get back into it, and then go again. I could come and go as I kind of please. And that actually worked in my favor. Uh, the transition from pros to out to what I'm doing now. You know, I want to say this, and, 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 and it may not apply to some of you right now, but things to look forward to moving down the road. You are more than just an athlete. 
right? And I want to say it again, because I think too many times I had heard so many stories about people losing their whole identity because all they can think about is the sport and they're so locked into the sport. And as you're, as you're young, from a young age, you're getting told, oh, you're going to go so far in this. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And your soul identity gets stuck into it. You are way more than an athlete. So it is okay to have other things that you're interested in away from the sport, right? So for me, I knew that when I was about 10, 11 years old, because I didn't want to be another one of those stories that people said, oh, he's just an athlete. I didn't want that feeling on me, right? So for me, the transition from sport to what I'm doing now, absolutely tough. There's always that stage of uncertainty. There's always that stage of, man, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right track? But just know that sometimes when something happens or things don't go our way, we may not understand what it, what's happening as we're going through it. But once we get through it, we're like, okay, that's why that happened. That's what I was trying to learn, right? So my last thing would definitely just say, you guys are all more than an athlete. So don't let anybody tell you, oh, you're just a track athlete. Matter of fact, the next person, somebody says that, man, just say, here we go again. Awesome, Akeem. Thanks so much, but I mean, yeah, great closing remarks as well. I really appreciate that. And I think it's a really good um, message to remind everyone, whatever stage you are at the right career is that you're not, a, you're not just an athlete. It's not just your whole identity. It, it's, it's part of what you do, but it's not who you are. So that's, that's absolutely. Yeah. So thank, thank you so much, Akeem. I really appreciate your time. And if you could in the, uh, in the chat there, just, um, put your website and a uh, link to your book maybe and your Instagram handle so that if people want to kind of follow you and keep in contact, they can do so. Um, okay. Was there any final questions for Akeem before we switch it over? I don't see any hands up. No, okay. Well, again, Akeem, thank you so much, buddy. Really appreciate it. Oh, it was a pleasure, man. Thank you guys again for having me. Yeah, you're so welcome. Um, okay, so next we've got Gary McGrath. So Gary is the uh, strength coach at Athletics Canada. He has a background in gymnastics and fencing and football and rugby. Um, he's going to take us through some concepts of periodization. So this is a little bit more towards the coaches that are going to be on the call. Um, but I really, I really implore the athletes to stick around as well because the athletes that I've certainly worked with, the more they know about why they're doing what they're doing, the better the athlete they're going to be. Um, if you're engaged in what you're doing and knowing the whys of why you do it, um, especially if you're looking at, you know, moving into coaching or moving into sports science or strength conditioning, um, some really good information coming at you. So, Gary, I'm really glad that you've uh, finally moved to a, a real sport in track and field. And I'm sure that uh, the challenges were, were pretty big making the shift from some of the other sports, but um, I'll, uh, I'll leave it with you and thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for uh, having me on. And yeah, just obviously to get the first thing out, I, I'm not just putting this accent on because it is St. Patrick's Day. I am actually <laughs> Irish. Uh, so you're not drunk yet. I you know it was only a matter of time before there was a calm across <laughs> there. Um, so yeah, different St. Patrick's Day for me this year, but the last year we are. Um, but yeah, so I guess to start, uh, I don't quite have the motivational speaking ecumen that uh, Akeem has, so I'm going to be relying on a PowerPoint. So, and again, apologies to anyone who is currently doing remote classes or remote lectures, and hopefully this doesn't feel like one of the regular college ones. Uh, so hopefully you should be able to see that now. Yep, we can see everything. Um, so yeah, so as Brendan said, just really want to touch on periodization. It's essentially what my job consists of, what I get paid for, so it's nice. Um, the main thing for me is just kind of come in with a higher definition of it, and there's lots and lots of them out there, and I think that's the thing for coaches in particular and athletes is that they're caught up with different definitions, and they all essentially mean the same thing. But So actually, before I do that, a quick intro, so Brendan covered that. So... Like I said, I'm from Ireland. I did my master's at UL before I worked with a professional rugby team. 
then moving across to a professional soccer academy and as well as a sports performance center in Scotland where the standard of athlete unfortunately isn't quite as high as it is in Canada but anyway and then finally moving on to CSIO Canadian Sports Institute Ontario and finally working here at Athletics Canada so it's been a bit of a whirlwind um, but I've gained from every position I've been in and ultimately hopefully helping people get medals with AC now in the coming year. Um, so yeah, back to that definition I was talking about. So periodization, this is my favorite one that I found. Like I said, there's many out there, but it's basically your optimal strategy for organizing your training and your strength and conditioning programs. So you're looking at a lot of things, but primarily the level of the athlete, which again, we've got different levels of athletes here. So it's going to be very different depending on your level what your competitive season consists of. So even Akeem hinted at that versus, for example, university to a pro athlete is very different. And then essentially you're just manipulating training to make sure you get uh, a positive outcome and making sure the fatigue is minimized. So I think, again, I'm gonna pick off, off Akeem's comments because he made a lot of really, really good ones. What he mentioned, obviously turning up a training every day and doing the little thing that he could do to make himself better. And from a coach's standpoint, I guess you could sum periodization up in that essentially trying to plan how that session is going to maximize that athlete's potential when they're there because anyone can make a really difficult session like anyone can come into me and I can make them sweat and feel really tired and feel like crap for two days afterwards and they'll say they trained really hard but does that actually have a positive effect when you add all those sessions up and you've got a competition at the end of the training block or at the end of the year or whatever it might be um so where it all comes from and hopefully this graph is fairly easy to understand but essentially you're looking at a performance level and essentially we, we're providing an alarm phase with training if you train continuously for a long time eventually you're either going to you're going to adapt at some point but if you keep applying the same stress you're just going to crash so it's like anything if you apply a stress to anyone whether it's work uh class different things if it's the same if it's repetitive and you don't ease up or you don't change then eventually the, the, the outcome becomes negative rather than positive so what we try to do is one apply the stress but apply it for just the right amount of time so easing up or deloading or recovery or whatever you want to call it at the right time to allow for some form of adaptation to occur and then you get this new level of performance over here and then obviously for you guys, that just adds up for athletes and coaches that adds up over a period of years, months, whatever it might be, 10 years. And then eventually you get people who win medals or people who get to whatever level of performance you want to get to um, that you've set out in your mind. So lecture time. Um, so there's like a lot of different types. So really the main reason I want to cover this off is not so that you're going to learn or try and take notes or anything like that. It's just that there is a lot of terminology that for me, it's just, it gets a little bit convoluted. And essentially you can summarize all these periodization and training in terms of just volume and intensity. So volume obviously being how much you're doing and intensity is simply how hard you're doing it. Um, so you'll see words like linear periodization, non-linear periodization, hypertrophy, strength, power, speed. And yes, they all have meanings and they, they're useful for us but you don't want to get caught up in the terms have an under basic understanding of what they are and then understand how they can benefit you and how you can then manipulate them to to get the training effects we talked about to improve performance um, so if you're looking at linear periodization it's pretty straightforward as time goes by volume goes down as time goes by intensity increases and you're just looking at peaking for a really important competition so if we look at athletics You've usually got like an indoor season, an outdoor season within that situation. You're looking at maybe a particular competition you want to peak for. So everything is building towards that. Um, and the intensity is just driving up as well as obviously the technique. So as you go on, the more you train, you hope your technique improves in line with, with how well you're training. Um, less common, but also out there is nonlinear periodization. So instead of intensity, increasing as the time goes by and the volume dropping at the same rate they just fluctuate so these can fluctuate across a week so you might have a simply like a hard day on a monday and a lighter day on a thursday and that repeats and you get this process where you've got this wave so heavy light heavy light whatever like that. so again they're just all related to the volume and the intensity it's nothing special about it and you might get you might find that people again get caught up in the words and you're lost just ask the question what does x y or z mean 
and you should be able to get a fairly straightforward explanation as to where it's going. More terms, so again, we, this is textbook stuff and I've spent sports science degrees learning about these. So you got a quad, which is four years, a macro cycle, which is a year, mesocycle, also known as a block or a phase, micro cycle is a week, and then a training session. So while the terms are out there, it's years, months, blocks, weeks, and sessions. And you're just working through those, but making sure that all of those things have a logical progression from session to session, from block to block, from year to year, from quad to quad for hopefully a lot of you where you're looking at that kind of a long-term space. Um, there isn't really anything hard and fast rules. Obviously the quad and the macro are always typically four and one. A training block can be anywhere from three to six. Sometimes they'll even be 12 weeks. A week is always a week. Um, same, with the, same with the training session. Some sessions can be longer, some can be less. It just has to make sense logically. So to wrap up the, the definitions, for me looking at blocks or mesocycles, you'll often see these types of terms. So general preparation, pre-competition, competition, accumulation. So the top two lines are probably the most common. Um, but again, it can kind of be summed up in the graph above where you're looking at lots of volume at the start in a typical linear periodization kind of model. And then volume decreases as the intensity increases across. So obviously your most intense phase is going to be when you're in competition. And it might not feel that way because the volume is less. So a lot of athletes actually, everyone, no one likes the accumulation or the general prep because it's high volume. It's a lot of work. It's if, if you're on a track, it can be reps, it can be distance, it can be long to short. But then once you get to competition phase, it doesn't feel like it's that intense for a lot of people but it's actually the highest and the most difficult part. And that over here in the peaking or the competition phase, that's what all this is for. Um, so you got to get this right. And if this part, if one and two aren't going well and it doesn't give you the results at three, then you need to maybe reevaluate what you're doing in your, your first two blocks, um, which kind of is the main piece as well. So a lot of times we look at these definitions and the blocks and the planning and it's almost like it's you have to do A, then you do B, then you do C. Whereas reevaluating and looking at actually what happened is going to give you the most information and the most feedback in terms of how do I then go back? So C gives us the info. I got to go back and plan B and A differently or better or the same if it worked. Um, it's not just repeat, reuse, recycle kind of stuff. So just to give you more of a real world example, um, just like easy, subtle, like easy differences between what a session might look like. So this is one of our uh, high jumpers, general preparation. When I talk about volume, you can see simple things like, so talking about in a session, three sets of 10, right? So it's 10 reps, three sets of it rest in between. The load is obviously there. So essentially that's corresponding to our intensity. Um, right now, because this was one of the first blocks, we don't actually have, you'll see in a later slide, like you'll see people put a percentage intensity. So 80%, 90%, whatever it might be. But if you don't have a baseline or if you don't have something to work off, then it's hard to do that. So you can use really simple things like um, reps in reserve, which is what that RIR stands for, or RPE, which is just how hard was it on a scale of one to 10. And if someone's training effectively, you would hope that the session, if, if you're doing it right, the sessions themselves will get easier if they stay the same, or if you make them harder, they'll stay the same level of difficulty. And if you've got someone who's doing an easy session and it feels hard, then you're probably looking at, if we look back at that first graph where they've just, they're just exhausted or they're overtrained or whatever it might be. So you have to reassess where you're going. Um, the other couple of things, just things are general. So you've got like lower body, you can see it here on the left. And this is just how I structure it. So I thought it might be useful to put in, but people structure it differently. Um, it just, I'm, I'm already, it's pretty clear I'm visual by the fact I have a PowerPoint on here. So, using Excel sheets to, to keep everything in line and just label things makes things pretty simple and clear to organize. So upper body strength and then just accessory exercises, whether it's um, lower body, you know, quad dominant hamstrings, which I'll touch on a little bit more later in terms of exercise selection. Moving on to, this is my favorite part and hopefully like similarly athletes and coaches, pre-comp or competition phases, things get a little bit more intense so you can see obviously the reps have shifted fairly dramatically from tens so the overall volume is way down 
Um, the exercises themselves have changed. So instead of full squats, for example, we're doing half squats. So it's you change the ranges of motion you can work in. And these are all just ways to, to manipulate volume and intensity. You change the intensity of the exercise. So a lot of people get caught up with Olympic lifting, certainly has its place. Um, so it's something you can look at, including if, if athletes are pretty, pretty good at it. And then more specific exercises, and then also just less exercises because there's just less volume overall. So just manipulating those two things again, ma manipulating the exercise a little bit to change the intensity. And just obviously the last thing is keeping it fresh. Like Akeem said, doing the same session every week, you're going to get pretty bored. So knowing how you want to progress exercises and how to make them either more interesting and then more sports specific, and then obviously improving performance as a result is, is going to be important. So it's good to have that structure. Um, a big one that stands out to me, and it's, I think this one's good for coaches and athletes alike, is just knowing how you can actually periodize, just training in general across your career. So obviously, yes, strength and conditioning is my bread and butter. Um, but I think even for just everyone, knowing how you structure things and how general planning changes as you progress in your career and what you can expect to see change. And so obviously, early careers and I've kind of gone so I've broken it down into career obviously a four-year quad and then an indoor season or a full season and then just blocks so as we go from early career or early in a quad or early in a season everything in terms of periodization can generally be a lot more general um, so you've more exercise selection more variation even for young athletes I think and this is a good one to highlight it's just having variation in the sports you play um, like there's a lot of proof out there and I know hopefully I don't rub anyone up the wrong way with that, but it's, it's early specialization tends not to be the way to go. Um, obviously there's essentially a time, eventually a time where you have to pick what you want to do and be able to put in the level of effort required for that specific sport. But the benefit that you will get from having that variation um, is massive. And even if you think about, training in a year again you can apply the same thing like just from talking with athletes that work around here if you dive in straight into year one and you're talking about not doing x y and z or not maybe playing something pickup sport or not doing something you enjoy doing because you've you've got to put all your time into this eventually it's not it's again it almost uh it increases the rate that you're going to get bored of it and increases the risk of exhaustion earlier on if you don't have that variety um as the season progresses, as a quad, as a career progresses, one, you might find that people just want less variety anyway, because it is, it's like, right, I'm a seasoned pro. I know what I want to do here. Um, so let's just do it and let's get it done. And that's it. And that's really useful um, because you can then just move into more specific and it's maximizing what you're doing in that instance. So it, it's definitely a balancing act um, with all of these, but generally speaking, it's, you're talking more, you're talking generally at the start to making things as specific as possible at the end. So you're getting the most bang for your buck when it is, when it's uh, the business end of a year or a season or whatever it might be. Um, so just kind of breaking it down and this is more my, a lot of what's come before has just been terms and words and various textbook definitions. This is just kind of how I process um, periodization in terms of not only just strength and conditioning, because I think I highlighted here, an S&C plan has to fit with the sports plan. So obviously I've worked with a lot of different sports, but with athletics, that's the main thing you want to be making sure is that whatever you're doing, whether it's in a gym setting or even if it's a recovery or a, active sports outside that it fits somewhat with what you're doing that it's not a um contradicting what you're what you're, the goals you've set for yourself but to go through it step by step one just identifying key competitions in the year or quad or whatever it might be and where you want to peak for identify the adaptations you want to target so again this is going back to what i was saying earlier about not necessarily having to go from a to b to c some guys can go in at b um, which I'll talk about a little later with the training adaptations themselves. But you need to know what you want someone to improve at in order to actually direct the training towards that. Knowing that working backwards from the competition to allow time for these adaptations to occur, because if you're trying to make a long-term process happen short-term, it generally won't work. It'll either just leave someone disappointed or in worst case scenario, it can leave someone getting injured. And then finally, like I said, checking that it fits with the sports training plan. 
And finally, the most important thing is if something doesn't feel like it's going right or if the feedback is wrong or the performance is wrong during that process, adjust as required. Um, again, periodization, it seems like it's this hard and fast thing you have to stick to. Just because you make a plan doesn't mean you have to stick to it. It's good to have it there in the first place, but you make rules to break or deviate from them. So um, that's kind of how I think about all of this. <clears throat> and to make it even simpler than that one, identify a gap, apply a stressor, recover, so let someone recover, adapt, test is the next big one, which I mentioned earlier. So just making sure that you can, you know that the progress is being made and then repeat or adjust as necessary. So if you're not making the progress you need to make, you need to rehash what you're doing. If it's working and you're continuing along the same path, then you can just repeat it or, or stick to the plan. Um, and then to just follow up on that testing point, for a lot of us, and I know Brendan mentioned that there's some testing coming up with AO. Um, the key one there is just establishing the performance indicator. So as an s &C coach, like we always kind of, people look for big gym PBs all the time. And a lot of s &C coaches will be delighted when they see like squat numbers increasing, but unless it's actually increasing the performance of an athlete, generally it's for nothing. So making sure that your performance indicators are sport specific. It's really easy in athletics, thankfully, because it's how far you threw something or how quickly you ran. In some of the other sports I've worked with, it's a little less straightforward. Um, but identifying those and making sure you're working towards them. Um, has the stressor actually caused improvement? It doesn't have to happen overnight. It doesn't even happen to have to happen over the course of the block, but are the signs there that the stressor is causing improvement? And then again, just continue or adjust as necessary. So this monitor and testing piece, I think for me, if you're training and going back to that kind of squat maxes and whatever one RM and testing, for me, testing and monitoring should always just be part of the training process itself. It doesn't need to be this big, um, like separate type NFL combine type situation where you get everyone out there and they have to do X, Y, and Z. It's, it's, it's definitely good for, from that standpoint to get the information. Um, but it's even better if you can fit it into the, the training process itself. So I think that's an, that's an important piece on that one. So just moving on away from the periodization piece, um, hopefully the lecture is going well so far for everyone, no one's asleep. Um, just looking at adaptations. So again, this kind of used to be this big cut and dry of strength is greater than 85% of your one at max and single effort and hypertrophy is between this and this, and you have to work 12 reps, um, which is definitely true to an extent. And there's a, like tremendous amounts of research on it. But I like this uh, graphic on the right, whereby it's, it's actually just way more of a continuum. So when we're looking at training and working with athletes, again, everything kind of works through in, in, a, in a continuum in terms of the intensity you're working at, just because you cut off at seven reps, doesn't mean you're not getting stronger or just because you've done uh, reps of 75 to 85 for six reps for whatever reason that might be doesn't mean you haven't done some sort of power work so you can still structure that in it just has to have a reasonable flow and a reasonable um, system in place to know where you're going so really looking at that and these adaptations these are generally the ones we look at um, as a strength and conditioning coach so for me you know hypertrophy is just building muscle so essentially depending on the sport and right now with athletics because i work all in speed power sports hypertrophy is a big element of it because you're essentially increasing the ceiling or increasing the capacity so how much how big how big a muscle is dictates how much force you can put out of it but that's not to say someone would, who is really really muscular knows how to use it which is the next part whereby actually being strong and using using that and then finally the power piece is essentially how quickly you can execute it. So if someone is really strong, if you look at a power lifter, they're not necessarily going to be a fantastic shot putter or a sprinter. Those people are able to apply tremendous amounts of force really, really, really quickly. Um, and that's what separates the, the elite from the crazy elite multiple medal winners and also the sub elite on the other side. It's, it's how quickly you can apply that force. And that's, Probably my favorite thing about athletics is because that is what the sport is in a nutshell. Um, coaches and trainers and everyone who's worked in are really, really good at understanding that because that's that's the, like Brendan was saying, the 0.1% or the 0.1, that'd be even smaller, um, that you're trying to get to 
a lot of other sports don't that isn't really understood because we'll hammer at heavy strength training and they'll hammer at a skill but they won't do speed work jumps throws all the stuff that are just essentially an, an athletics training program so that's one area that makes my job a lot easier in, in athletics but it's something to consider and even still which brings me to that is a lot of these things don't have to actually have to happen in a weight room so you can work on strength and power and hypertrophy and muscular endurance elsewhere like on the track with med balls with sleds with whatever it might be so when you're thinking about your training it doesn't just have to happen you know exclusively one is in the weight room and one is on the track or in circular it's it all fits in somewhere and it has to like i said it has to complement each other uh, this is just a bigger graph of what i just showed you i won't go through all this because there's a lot in it but this is one that i think is really really good and i put the it's, it's put out by a guy called matt jordan who works in csi calgary um who works with a lot of different sports he's very good speaker as well but this kind of just sums up all the different types of adaptation we can try and get um during training so there's a lot a lot in here but it's something that you can work out maybe it's if you want like again the video is there if people want to come back and look at it it's something worth looking at it it goes beyond just the strength and the hypertrophy but like i was talking about the early rate of force development late rate of force development and how that all fits and works with with training those skills to improve performance. Um, this is probably the one of the most useful parts of all this. Um, so exercise selection. So while it's good to know about how those all things are going to fit, it's just even having an exercise library is one of the biggest things. And knowing what you can work through and how you can, like, am I confident in X, Y, and Z? And how can I progress those? Um, so for me, these are pretty much the foundational movements that I'll always work off. There's some more complex things, like I said, weightlifting can come after these. But for anyone who's starting or anyone who's relatively new, and I think that's a lot of athletes are um, newer to weight training than their actual sport, obviously. You're looking at squat patterns, so the hinge pattern. So basically, I don't know if anyone's ever seen just any time you bend over to pick something up. So how does that look? So does someone completely just fold over? Can they actually move happily? And then can they pick up heavy things like a health and safety manual would tell them to um, push. So any sort of push up or pulling. Um, pulls obviously the opposite. So TRX rows, you'll see a lot. Pull ups themselves. Lunges. So moving more towards single leg stuff, which is again important for athletics. Um, Core exercises, so massively broad topic, understanding that essentially with athletics, all we're looking for is one, do we have a core that's foundationally stable? And then two, can we kind of transfer force from the lower body to the upper body and vice versa? Um, that's what it's there for. So making sure that we don't get too caught up with uh, beach muscles, essentially, even though a lot of these guys have them, but making sure that it's functional. Um, and then gait slash carry, whatever it might be. So even just watching someone walk and someone move can tell you a lot about how things are happening further up the chain. Um, so how their foot works, how they're moving when they increase the speed. So again, like sprint coaches will be the experts in this. I can't even touch these guys. It's like they see, see things in slow motion. Um, but how people run versus how they walk versus how they jog versus how they go to maximum velocity and same with honestly any of the any of the sports when you see see someone go through the full exercise itself um, what are the gaps you can identify and just again for me i just posted up some of the easy exercise to start with and this is becoming a lot more accessible for everyone now between social media and what you can see online um which is good and sometimes bad but just seeing exercise variations and how you can progress things. And finally, with these progressions, there doesn't need to be a rush to do it because it just has to be steady and functional. And like I said, making sure people are just improving. It does not all have to happen at once. Um, so, yeah, so to kind of sum up my strength and conditioning philosophy, you're essentially just looking at building muscle if it needs to be built. And it again, in strength and power sports, that generally seems to be the case. Um, learn to activate it. So a little bit coming back about how quickly I can apply the force. So just doing things fast. 
and then learning to use it. So also you will see people who can apply a lot of force quickly, but then when you put them into their sport or their activity, it happens too quick. They can't decelerate enough. The balance is off. So it becomes a kinesthetic thing where you have to allow time for all of those um, phases to happen. And I think for me as well, again, going back to making sure that everything complements the training process, that things fit. A lot of times we see, and again, hopefully, yeah, like strength and conditioning for me, and even coming to athletics is a lot of times, one of the old things was people would be like, well, it makes me slow. And sure thing, if, if you put someone in a gym and fatigue them continuously and just do heavy strength training without doing their actual sport, whatever it might be, sprinting and throwing, once they go back to that sport, it's going to be difficult because you've just worked a completely different system without working the other one to complement it. So having that balance of things, even if, even if you do focus at one point on the, the muscle and the training side, you got to keep an element of the other one in there or even just keeping an element of sport or athleticism in on top of it. Um, really important so that you don't, I guess, play up to that stereotype that it's going to make people slow or move less well. Um, if it's balanced right and it supports the, the training process itself, then it's, it's a huge compliment to it. And then also just to wrap up on that, if, if people do or don't need to build muscle, then it's a process you can just skip. So obviously there's people out there who are just optimally built for the sport and they've reached their peak, but there's, there's definitely other areas they can work on in order to, to get better, uh, unless you're number one. And even those guys are trying to get better too. So, um, so yeah, just to kind of wrap it up. So I had this one up already. So it's just to keep them simple, the S and C philosophy in three quick sentences, periodization, hopefully wrapped up in three quick sentences. So again, the stressor, recover, adapt, test, repeat. And then the testing process as well, just so that knowing how you're actually making progress and then determining how you're going to adjust based on those results. So that's me. Obviously, it had to go in here. Um, <laughs> law fell apart. So I just thought, if nothing else, if you didn't learn anything about periodization, you'd at least learn how to say Happy St. Patrick's Day in Irish, which I think is useful. Um, and yeah, that's me. So any questions? Shoot. Thanks, Gary. Does anyone have any questions um, for Gary? A lot of content there. Thanks so much, buddy. Um, any questions in the chat or if you want to just unmute yourself and ask a question, go right ahead. Okay. Kathy's asked, can you elaborate on when to use three sets or four sets, et cetera? So this is very much, and this is a classic response from any coach ever. It's a very much an it depends answer. Um, mm -hmm. So depending on the training goal, so looking at those training adaptations, those that long list up above. Um, I guess, Kathy, so what, I guess to answer it best, what, sort of athletes would you be working with in terms of level or is it right across the board might help answer i am the athlete oh you are the athlete even better um so honestly it doesn't make, make a massive difference so three to four sets depending on how like obviously three sets of 50 is going to be a lot different from four sets of 12 but when the volume equates itself um it's it's similar stuff. So like you saw, I put up in the program with sometimes it's just personal preference. And oftentimes I'll have guys with athletes, you know, like you, you might've, even for me, I'll have a program laid out for three sets, but if the first set doesn't look good or it doesn't feel good for someone, you can put it down as a warm up set. It's just making sure that your volume steadily progresses. Or in the case of if it's peaking, it's the volume is steadily decreasing. So it allows your intensity to go up. So if you have three sets of five uh, in the first week, an easy way to accumulate volume is to just do a fourth set of five at the same weight the next week. And then you will have five sets of five the week after. But then if you want to suddenly start increasing the intensity or the load, you would take the reps or the sets down and the load itself would go up. I wish I should go back to my graph. But it's, it's, it's really, and it depends. So it's like, 
just making sure that it has a, a logical progression from set to set and from week to week. Um, honestly, even if I'm looking at like the basics of that whole presentation is if you have a, some, an exercise that you're doing for whatever the rep range might be, and if you can do it in week one and you can do two of those three sets with let's say 50 pounds, and then the next week you do them at 55 pounds, and so on with that steady progression, you're doing pretty well until you will eventually reach a point where you can't increase. So then you have to move something else. So it'll be the reps or the sets or the load on the bear. Kathy, does that answer your question fairly well or is it too much? It depends. No, it's good. It's good. Thank you very much. If, if there's a specific exercise or anthem that's uh, the question is specific too, then I'm happy to answer on that too. But yeah, I know, I understand it's a lot of it depends on a lot of numbers and graphs. Uh, Gary, I've got a, a question from uh, Coach Harry. He's asking um, what, he's, what your thoughts are on triphasic training. Another buzzword. Uh, so triphasic training. Uh, so thoughts on it. One, obviously it's out there. I use it. Um, to, again, it's just another method of getting a training effect. So for anyone who doesn't know, because I think that might be important, um, essentially what you're looking at with triphasic is you have, instead of manipulating or looking too much at the, the sets and reps, it actually does a thing where it will manipulate the tempo. So you'll have the first week will be an eccentric week. So if you're doing five repetitions, you'll take a six second eccentric. So if that's a bench press as you lower the bar to your chest it has to take six seconds and you drive it up as quick as you can that's the first phase of the triphasic the second phase is um, instead of the six second lower and you actually would take at least like a five or a seven second pause at your chest and then shoot it back up as quick as you can and then the last phase is just typical training what you'll see people do where they drop the bar to their chest and just drive it up as quick as you can um, so that's the explanation and you can obviously you can apply it to any exercise but usually it's the main ones like i listed so a squat or a bench press or uh, yeah that's pretty much honestly it deadlifts um and they'll usually complement that with explosive exercises or movements so jumps which i'm a big fan of um which they'll also call contrast training so for athletics um I like the contrast element because I think the big thing for athletes is it provides, uh, um, one, it brings in a power element, but two, it almost provides a link between strength training and the track. So if you have someone who is doing uh, heavy movement and then it's a med ball movement and they throw a shot, it kind of bridges or even doing jumps in between sprint training. So that's one side of it I like. Um, but again, it just, my thoughts is it's, it's just another train it's a training method right so it's just something that it's a it's a tool in your toolbox that you can employ but it's it's not going to be this thing that like makes causes absolutely magical results any more than anything else and even the guys who who've uh, founded it i know they've done it with even people as low as high school athletes but they'll always say you want to have basically exhausted a lot of the possibilities before you start needing to do triphasic or um, going into it. There's certain elements you can take from it for sure, but um, there's simpler training methods that you can employ first and then get to those ones later on in a career. So that kind of, yeah, even that the bit I put up earlier, that to me would be like a more specific type of training. Um, so comment for the mid distance. Yeah, I knew this was going to come up. So, uh, more blocks here. Okay. Um, yeah. So just to reply to Harry Stansos's comment, uh, I knew this was going to happen because this is just me feeding into my own biases with uh, strength and conditioning for my the guys I'm coaching. If there is any questions around the endurance side, so I kind of skimmed over it with the the muscular endurance on um, that training adaptations piece. But equally important, so again, depending on what your sport is, making sure that the adaptation that you're trying to get fits with what you're actually trying to get. So, yes, there's probably an element of less need for like maximal explosive power and obviously compared to a shot put with a mid or long distance runner. 
But even in saying that, if you were to look at those programs that I put up earlier, I'd be pretty happy to, to do some of those things with, with middle distance runners and long distance runners. Because I would, you're looking at, again, just knowing what the justification for the exercise selection is. Uh, I think for a lot of mid distance, because one thing I've noticed with working with, with a few over the, um, even during COVID and stuff, because different training processes happened and different coaches, people were in different places. I had, I was lucky enough to work with some guys. Um, I noticed that because mid distance and long distance runners are so used to volume and almost to me, what I would find just really boring, if I'm being honest, like that's volume and that's the training because that's what they're good at. I found that they deal better with obviously the volume in the gym side and also the length of training blocks that they can work through. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions around that and that type of training, then for sure, um, fire them in. Gary, I had a question around, um, I guess, the different periodization strategies. Um, you mentioned a couple of them, sort of block and a block and undulating and linear. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, how, if, have you experimented, experimented much with different strategies and different protocols and have you found that it you know certain strategies work with different populations a little bit better maybe age groups or or genders or events yeah so i think um one yes of like experiment with all to an extent um in terms of finding it works with different gender like everything just works differently with or better with different individuals. Um, so in terms of finding with different groups, like keeping things simple, like I said, more general stuff for kids and younger groups, I think is really important because then you, like I said, you give someone an exercise library so they can do everything that they need to be able to do. Um, so then finding the, the, the progressions in that is probably like, realistically it's linear periodization for those guys. Um, I've done a little bit less of undulating stuff with the high volume, but uh, or you know varying it from week to week or month to month, just because I find that it, it can be a little bit confusing for athletes. But there's definitely people who it works for, and even like you'll even have those conversations week to week where you have a guy in and will have gone heavier on a Monday, and it'll be like, can I go a bit easier today? And I mean, it's technically undulating periodization, but it's also just kind of common sense from talking with an athlete or a coach to say let's let's just modify based on that. So um, it's always just about making sure that the, for me, how to sum it up, I guess it's linear. So it's, I'll usually look at um, a four week block of the first week having the most volume. So the most reps and sets through to week three, or actually we'll keep the volume the same and we'll increase the intensity steadily as the weeks go on. And then the fourth week, while it'll be a deload week, It'll also be like our little mini test week where we actually ramp up the intensity and just kind of get a, a grasp on where they are. And then finally, I said three or four. So that just fits in with what the coaches themselves are doing in the sport. So if there's no point in me having extra, a plan in my head that doesn't actually complement what they're, they're doing on the track. So that's the other thing. Okay. Any more questions? I've got one more, but I realize it's getting a little bit late in the evening. And you do have to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, Gary. So um, uh, any more questions? I've got one more if no one's got any more in the chat. Okay, so this is a, a little bit off topic with um, periodization, but certainly a pretty common question in the strength and conditioning space, especially for track and field athletes. And I know there's a lot of buzz around uh, categorizing athletes as either pullers or pushers, whether they're quad dominant or glute dominant, hamstring dominant. And that sort of feeds into what they do in the weight room. And I mean, some athletes are really good at certain movements and not good at others. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you approach that as far as addressing weaknesses. And especially when it comes to pre-competition, do you just give them the lifts that they like, the ones that they're good at? Um, how do you kind of negotiate that, that, you know, those patterns and those different movements in the gym? Yeah, so I'm pretty much just going to word for word quote what I think one of your former colleagues said on a podcast I was listening to because it's a similar to Stu McMillan. And it is, it's just that it's, um, so in terms of weaknesses, and again, you're talking about athletes in a season, but even if I, like going back to the young athletes, address weaknesses early on when there's less, like you say, less competitions, less stuff happening. So you can get those covered off. But when it comes to in-season and competition time, yeah, you, for me, I would want athletes doing 
what they're best at and what they're most confident in, because that's obviously going to feed into the rest of their performance. Um, but you can't just ignore the weaknesses for the whole season. And even for me, if we can, like having the big, the, the periodized plan, but also just any opportunity where it's like, okay, this is a chance to, and they use the term microdosing now is another popular term, but just drop in something that will just give me the minimum effective dose that I'm content will keep that athlete healthy or will maximize their performance for what we're doing um, is also really, really useful. You don't have to, yeah, like you have the plan in place, but if there's an opportunity and you're like, okay, maybe now is actually a good time to do this because we may not get this again. And this is something just from right now, because obviously COVID and schedules are, are crazy. So it's like, this was the plan, but maybe we do this now because this, the, the schedule's changed. We have to do it now. So um, we'll go with one more week of, we'll do this to get the weaknesses. And now there's three competitions coming up. So we're not going to worry about that. Uh, but yeah, as a general trend, it's usually get the weaknesses um, covered off early on and then work more towards strengths when possible. And the other final piece on that is hopefully if you're working on their weaknesses um, early on is that they'll improve and then you can actually keep those things in the program to an extent during competition phases because they no longer think that's, the, that's their biggest limiting factor. For sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um... And checks out. I like it. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate your time tonight. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, Gary, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat um, any any way sort of, of contacting you. I don't know if you're willing to share some of the slides. There was some pretty dense information there yeah. that I'm sure some of the athletes and coaches would love to see. Yeah. If there's any chance you could, you know, say if someone e emails you, you could send that over. That'd be great. Um, Perfect. Uh, if not any sort of any contact sort of details I can have yeah. you, that would be awesome. Uh, let's stick that in. Uh, and before everyone goes, there's just down the bottom here, a little poll, it should take you about a minute. I just wanted to get an indication of um, the session. Um, and please, you know, the athletes and coaches, this is very much for you guys. So if you have topics and things that, that are pressing, you want to learn more about, um, we've got some great resources at, at Athletics Ontario that we can kind of make the most of. So please let us know what those questions are and what those topics are. And we really want to build out a really good education that's, that's um, covering everything we need to, to cover for, for you as athletes and coaches as you, as you work through uh, the troubling times at the moment, but as your careers get um, longer and more uh, illustrious. Um, any closing questions for anyone at all? No? Okay. Well, have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. Please, I'll, I'll just leave the uh, I'll leave the uh, the session open for about five minutes. So if you can go down and just do that little quick poll to answer any questions. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing you next month.